from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got three exciting lessons about science, reading, and English. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanes, and we're kicking off today's episode with an exciting science lesson. Now, personally, my favorite season is summer. My wife likes spring the most, and my daughter loves winter. But what causes us to have different seasons? Well, to help us answer that question, let's go visit Miss Sharp. Good evening class, I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. Today's lesson will have us exploring the seasons and how they are affected by the Earth's axis and the Sun. Why do the seasons change? Well this is because the Earth is tilted on an axis as it orbits around the Sun. This means that the seasons are dependent on what section of the Earth is facing the Sun as it orbits. This also means that the Earth is divided into hemispheres, the Southern and the Northern Hemisphere. The seasons will be different in each hemisphere because of the Earth's axis. An example of this is in the southern hemisphere where it could be summer, and in the northern hemisphere it would be winter. This difference is because the Earth is in the position where the southern hemisphere is in the most direct line to the Sun, and the northern hemisphere is in the least direct position. The axis or the tilt of the Earth never changes. The only thing that changes is the position of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. This process is different than the Earth's rotation which dictates the day and the night cycle. Now if this had been in person, I would have given out something like these printouts. However, since this is a virtual lesson, I will walk you through making your own. Before we start, you will need four pieces of paper. It can be any paper you want, but it would be best if it was printer paper. To begin, we will use our crayons or coloring pencils to color a tree to represent each season. We can draw them in any way with the colors we believe to represent each season. You will want to draw each tree twice.
Next, we will be drawing the Earth's axis four times and the Sun four times. Make sure that when we begin cutting them out, that there is enough room around the Sun and the Earth so that we can position them later. Then we need to make labels for the northern and southern hemispheres, as well as labels for December, March, June, and September. Now it is time to start cutting things out. And lastly, we begin to tape things down where they're supposed to go. Begin this step by taping down the northern and southern hemispheres. Then we tape down the labels for the months and leave room in between for the rest of our items. Next, we can use our guide to tape down our seasons. So for December, it is winter in the north and summer in the south. In March, it is spring in the north and fall in the south. In June, it is summer in the north and winter in the south. And finally, in September, it is fall in the north and spring in the south. Now we tape down our suns. Now we consult the guide to see where the earth should be. So for December, it should be to the right. For March, we tape it above our sun. For June, we tape it to the left of our sun. Lastly, for September, we tape it below our sun. Now we can write our names at the bottom corner of our boards and we are done. Thanks, Miss Sharp. All right, next up, Mrs. Milanese is going to read us a story about a little lightning bug who has a big problem. Let's check it out. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Milanese, and today I'm going to be reading you a story. I found this story on an app called Epic. Epic is a free app that you can download onto a phone, tablet, or iPad, and there are tons of stories to choose from. I chose a really cool one for us today, so let's check it out. Today's book is from a series called Once Upon a Garden, and this one is titled Lucy's Light. The author is Joe Rooks, and the illustrator is also Joe Rooks. Lucy was a lightning bug. And the most talented flyer in the squad, she could perform perfect loop-de-loops and zigzag through the trees at terrific speed. Zoom! Everyone was very impressed. One day, Miss Sparks had some news. It's time to learn night flying, she said. Practice is at sunset. Everyone was very excited. Everyone except Lucy, because Lucy was a lightning bug who didn't light up, not even a flicker. Who ever heard of a lightning bug who doesn't light up, said Lucy. Just follow us, said Fliss kindly. Maybe my light will appear if I fly in a different way, thought Lucy. So Lucy flew higher, lower, faster, 
slower. Round and around and upside down until crash. But Lucy's light still didn't appear. When Lucy had caught up with the others, they were having a rest on a big rock. It turns out I'm not a lightning bug after all, said Lucy. I'm just an ordinary bug. She was about to fly home when the rock croaked. Toad! They'll brighten up our gloomy bog, said the newt. What about that one, said the frog, pointing to Lucy. No, that's just an ordinary bug, laughed the toad. All of a sudden... Lucy felt an inner strength burning inside her. She knew there was only one thing to do. Zoom! She frightened the frog. Whiz! She dizzied the newt. Noom! She terrified the toad. Now hop to it, said Lucy. They were so scared that they ran off back to their bog. Lucy used her super strength to set the lightning bugs free and everyone cheered. They were so thankful to Lucy that she was given a special medal. You're no ordinary bug, Lucy, said Miss Sparks. You're the bravest bug in the whole garden. And she never forgot that doing a good deed will always make you shine bright. The end. On the Epic app, there are so many other books just like this. Let's take a look at Layla's Luck. Layla's Luck is also part of Once Upon a Garden, written and illustrated by Joe Rooks. This is Layla. Lady bugs are known to be lucky. And Layla thought she was very lucky indeed. She had a lucky charm for every occasion. Some lucky socks, a lucky shamrock, a lucky cup, a lucky spoon, a lucky pencil, a lucky number, and a lucky watering can. When Layla won the race on sports day, she thanked her lucky socks. When she got a good grade on her spelling test, she cheered her lucky pencil. And when she grew the tallest flowers, she praised her lucky watering can. One day, something very exciting was happening in the garden. William was looking up recipes. Bella was finding ingredients, and Eddie was weighing them out. Layla thought baking looked very complicated. Then she had an idea. I'll use my lucky charms to bake a cake, said Layla, the most delicious cake ever. So Layla hurried home. She couldn't wait to get started. Layla went to her kitchen and she found her lucky cup to measure out the ingredients. She stirred it all together with her lucky spoon. Then she put it in the oven for three hours. Layla's lucky number. But when she took it out, it didn't look delicious at all. Layla felt very sad. How can a lucky ladybug be this unlucky? Then she noticed a delicious smell wafting through the window. Layla followed the smell right to Bella's kitchen. They were melting mud brownies, pollen pop cakes, and even toadstool tarts. 
My lucky charms aren't lucky anymore. All I've baked is one big mess, said Layla sadly. Don't worry, Layla, they said. It's not your lucky charms that help you succeed. Your achievements come from you. Winning the race on sports day showed that your hard work and training had paid off, said Bella. Getting a good grade on your spelling test proves that trying your best got results, said William. And your flowers grew so tall because you cared for them and watered them every day, said Eddie. Layla realized that she didn't need any that she didn't need her lucky charms after all. And with a little help from her friends, Layla baked the most delicious cake ever. The end. Thanks, Mrs. Milanese. Now for our final segment today, Miss Smith is going to share with us an English lesson about asking questions. Let's check it out. Hello. Today we'll be dealing with how to form questions in English. Now the verb to be is, is really easy to form into questions. And down here, if you don't know the forms, this is the verb to be. Okay, I am, you are, he, she, or it is, we are, you are, they are. So there are three forms of this verb. If, if you just want to ask a simple question, for example, are you from Mexico? Is he sick? Are they your neighbors? then the verb goes right before the subject. Okay. So are you. In a sentence it would be you are. Okay. So very simple to form a question with the verb to be. The verb to be is also used in questions that have the ing form of a verb or the ed form of a verb of an action verb. For example, are you learning English? Okay, Learn plus the ing. This is the um, progressive form of the verb. Watch or watching. Is she watching TV? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Right. Are you interested in math? So here's a verb, interest, and if you add the ed, that's a past, it's a participle. Okay. And you have to have a helping verb with it. That is where you use a form of the verb to be. Is he finished with his homework? Right. Now this is how you can use the verb to be in forming a question. But this is only one small part of, of making questions in English. To use other verbs in a question, you need an auxiliary or a helping verb. Okay? You have to have one. For example, you can use do or does, and that verb is down here, can, may, or will. Okay? For example, do you need some help? Need is our primary verb. Okay? But with the verb to be, we could just put verb subject. Okay? But we cannot say need you. Need you some help. That's, that doesn't work in English. So you have to have the helping verb do. Does she speak English? Here it's does because you have to use does with he, she, or it. Do we register here? Does it rain a lot in West Virginia? When you're talking about not a person but just an idea or a thing or a place, then you want to use the word it. Rain llover, okay, in Spanish. So does it rain 
a lot in West Virginia. Do they live near you? And you can see that these underlined verbs are all, these are the main verbs and these are the helping or auxiliary verbs. We can also use can, may, or will. Okay? May I help you? Can he speak Chinese? Okay. Asking about his ability to speak Chinese. Will you send me that recipe? And will indicates a future, more of a future action. Okay, so for most questions in English that require something other than the verb to be, you have to have one of these helping verbs before your main verb. All right, here's a little quiz. And we'll go through this together. You can uh, try to guess the answer, see how well you do. Choose the correct helping verb, do or does, okay. can, may, or will. And I put down here also, they have kind of special meanings. Or you could use am, is, and are if it's just a simple question. Okay. Number one, what do you think you would use in that question? There is, there's no other verb right here, okay? So it's just going to be are, okay? Are you sure that the test is today, okay? but there's no verb right in here. There's no, there's no verb following the subject. Now here we have the verb live. Okay. So live implies that we have to have a helping verb. So we're going to have to use one of these. Okay. Does. Does she live with you? Here's another one. Going is an ing form of the verb. And if you remember, with the ing form, we use um, our helping verb is going to be um, one of these. So you, we would have to use are. Are you going to the concert? Uh, help is the verb here. Now, do you help me with my project is a little bit awkward. Can you help me? Yeah, that works. Do you have the ability or the time to help me? Mm -hmm. uh, will will you help me indicates I'm asking a favor that you can do sometime in the future. So here you have a choice, okay? Can you help me or will you help me? Either one of those is correct. Okay. This would be, if you, if you thought is, you were correct. Is he a student here? This is the only verb. There's no other verb, okay? So you have to, have to use a form of the verb to be. Here's your ing form of this verb. And the subject is they. You need are, okay? Are they working now? Here is, actually you have two verbs here. Have to stay, so it's a verb phrase. And you need do. Okay. 
here's your subject I, here's your ING form of the verb. So again, you have to use to be as your helping verb. So, am. Okay? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Come, here's your main verb. Did you come up with two different possibilities? Okay. Now, since you have a main verb, you have to have one of these as a helping verb. If you said, do we come in for a few minutes, then that's kind of an awkward sentence. Okay. Can we come in? Is it possible for us to come in? Okay, can would work. May we come in? This is asking permission. Okay, that's a little better. Now, will we come in? How does that person know if you're going to come in or not? This is, again, doesn't make a lot of sense. So you could use can or may. Those would be the two best ones, okay? Can we come in or may we, may we come in? And the last one, to join us for dinner, okay? Want to join. Again, here you have actually a verb phrase, want to join. So you have to have one of these as a helping verb. And since it's you, Okay, we will use do. Do you want to join us for dinner? You could use will. Will you want to join us? But do is perfectly fine. Okay. I hope you did fairly well. I hope you understand um, how to use helping verbs in a question. It's quite different in other languages. Thanks, Ms. Smith. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons, and we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.